basically my music is based on a connection through prayer. And I, I, I pray every day. I pray for other people more than myself. And I also, I'm not saying that to be cool, but that's what I think of. Because a lot of my prayers, I found out they were just what I wanted, not what I needed. And what I want is when I'm helping other people, then it's like a tree or, or roots in the ground. It'll grow back to you. So don't worry about it, but keep in prayer. And my prayers are like yours, uh, are my music. That's a prayer. It's a song. Sure. Um, uh, helping somebody with a meal, pay for it. That's a prayer. But it's an active prayer. It's a living prayer. Welcome to the Morse Code Podcast, where we talk with entrepreneurially minded creatives in music, film, and writing. My name's Corby, and I'm hoping these conversations inspire you to push deeper into your own work, whether you're a full-time professional or just starting out on your own creative odyssey. Thanks to everyone who came out to the five spot in East Nashville to celebrate the six month anniversary of the podcast. It was as of this taping last night, and I'm still buzzing. Sometimes you have these experiences in your life that resonate so loudly that you can't help but take them as indications that you're heading somewhere you want to go. Being in the same room as many of the guests we've had on the show, musicians, writers, filmmakers, seeing them interact with each other and, and also see each other do the thing they were put on earth to do, man, it filled my heart all the way up. Speaking of inspiration, our guest today is one of the most amazing people I know. The man goes deep and does not wait. Three-time Grammy winner, multi-instrumental singer-songwriter, winner of numerous Native American awards, and acclaimed painter, Bill Miller was born on the Stockbridge Muncie Reservation in northern Wisconsin. His big break came when Tori Amos discovered his music and invited him to open her huge tour for the Under the Pink album. After that, it was the same thing with Pearl Jam. If you ever saw Disney's Pocahontas, you remember the song Colors of the Wind that was sung by Vanessa Williams. Well, that's Bill's flute playing throughout. That song won a Grammy and both the Academy Award and Golden Globe Award for Best Original Song. I wrote this song called Crow Country for my last album. I was living in Montana at the time and going through some stuff. And when it came time to record it, my friend told me about this guy, Bill Miller. I got Bill's number and he actually called me back. He came over to my house and played and sang. And, and more than that, we were just kind of instant friends. We've since played shows together. He was a featured guest at last year's Spring Fling, an event my wife Rand and I put on every year that takes place in our front yard here in East Nashville. All this between his constant tours and festival appearances. I want to say one more thing before we get to the conversation, which is that in spite of his many accolades, Bill has suffered plenty. Details, unimportant, but a lot of times you meet people who maybe had a moment or two and then spend the rest of their lives bitter about something they can't change. Bill could not be farther from that. He's a wide open spirit and he's one of the most generous people I know. I'm really excited to share this conversation with you. Well, I should say conversation and concert because we got to play a few songs together too. If you get something out of the Morse Code podcast, please take a second to like and subscribe. And now, here's my conversation with Bill Miller. Bill Miller, my man, it's so good to see you. <laughs> good to see you too. Thanks bro. so much for making time for us here. Yeah. I'm excited to talk to you. And uh, I thought we could touch on, I mean, well, let's just, where to even start? You've had uh, such an illustrious career. We were talking before the mics came on about... Um, you touring with Pearl Jam at the height of their fame, really, in 94, and Tori Amos. And let's get into that. And um, and you, you're you also uh, maybe even busier than ever. I can't even get a hold of you right now. You, I am. You're barely in town. <laughs> I am. I'm busy with family and um, artistic ventures. And then my management is really doing a great job uh, getting my career uh, together. My manager, Charlie, he... Uh, the main thing that he sees in me that I've never seen in other, any other manager is he said, you have a story, Bill, and that's the most important thing I want to focus on is your story. And when you tell your story to your audiences, that makes a big difference. And when you share it through the way you write your songs, so it is all about that. Yeah, that, this was, that's perfect for us here, yeah. too, because I want to hear your story. Well, the Pearl Jam thing was short and sweet. I could have done a few more dates with them, but they called, their management called me out of the blue 
um, about this uh, Mount Graham benefit in Mesa, Arizona. And um, it was to deal with um, the state was going to build a um, telescope mm. on the Apache Indian Reservation, and they were going to put it on some rare plants that the tribe still use, uses for healing. Mm. And we were fighting against it. So they wanted me on this benefit thing a few days. And um, I said, yeah, man. So I didn't. I knew who Pearl Jam. I heard of them, but I never heard their music. And I go, oh, cool. Sounds like a cool folk group. Not. <laughs> I mean, they were, they were cool, but I listened to their records. I go, oh, my God, that's Pearl Jam. And um, I flew out there, and we did these shows. And it was a life changer. Mm -hmm. it, some things in life, you're with people, and you don't need 400 dates to get who they are. Sure. Eddie Vedder's like that. Mm -hmm. The band Pearl Jam's like that. Two days with them was enough. And their audience <laughs> at that time was like, I'm done. I can't handle these <laughs> it's like mosh too pits. much of a good thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, mosh pits. Oh, my God. It was terrible. It was the season but of mosh pits. That time in my life, I was meeting, and I don't, and nobody, like a lot of uh, uh, people in the industry, they line up meetings. Well, I want you to meet uh, Kirk Douglas because I want you to be in a biblical film or whatever, you know. And we'll get you to dinner together. And all these things line up. Nah, nah, nah. It never happened that way with me. I get these random calls. Tori Amos called from Ireland to my manager at that time. And um, I happened to be in the office. So he said, yes. He says, uh, do you manage Bill Miller? Yeah, I do. Oh, my name is Tori Amos. He goes, Tori Amos? You mean the one that, that has the song God out right now? She says, yeah. Um, what do you need Bill for? Well, I'm with a good friend of mine. We want to talk with Bill. Can you get him in the office? He, well, he's in the office right now. So I get up to the phone. We're on speakerphone. I said, hey, Tori. Hey, Bill. She goes, um, I just was recommended by a good friend of mine. I'll get him on the phone with you right now. He's got a British accent. And I says, yes, it's Bill. Yes. Oh, it's just, it's just great to talk with you. And he goes, uh, my name is Bono. And it was Bono, and he was on the phone. He goes, Tori and I have having dinner together, and she's doing it under the pink tour. And I supposedly, if I remember right, she had hundreds of cassettes. We had cassettes. And he said, you got to listen to this guy. His name's Bill Miller. He's got an album called The Red Road. And that was the album that turned it on. And then she said to me, I'd love to have you on the tour, Bill. I love this record. Um, but I don't want you to be offended because I know you're a believer in God. I said, I am. She says, so am I. I said, well, what, what are you offending me for? Said, My song, did you hear the song God? I go, yeah, I've heard it. Does it offend you? No, it doesn't offend me. Yeah. Well, let's do it. And it was the biggest tour I've ever been on. Tori treated me like a king. I mean, I, I just became dear friends with her. Still am to this day. I'd love to tour with her again. But uh, she was a phenomenal, phenomenal musician. Um, full. And that, that was one relationship a musical relationship that I enjoyed being with for over 200-some dates with her. I just I never got tired of it. Never got tired of listening to her every night. Mm -hmm. It just expanded me, somehow pushed me. And I asked her, I said, Tori, why, why do you have me? It's just me and a guitar, and I had a bass player with me. She said, because, Bill, you push me. You push me to a higher limit each night. I think you have a strong spirit. She goes, your music is um, cinematic, and I want to remain in that zone. You, you, you tell stories. I went, whoa. And uh, the, the other person, the last person I'll talk about before we get into me and you talking, but um, I was on um, West Virginia Public Radio. What was that show called? Uh, um, Mountain Songs? Yeah, Mountain Stage. Mountain Stage. And um, I was on there quite a few times, but one night I was on there with these um, incredible... Um, Mississippi Delta blues players acoustic and they asked me to sit in with them and play a couple songs because I was sound checking I, I can do some blues picking and stuff and man man you want to sit in with us and they were mostly African American players about four or five of them and then the other guy was uh, John um, why am I spacing his name but his dad produced Dylan but he's a white guy but he kicked butt and he goes Bill you can sit in with us and I'm like you guys are way better than me but I played with them then this young kid came up behind us during sound check, and he had a Telecaster hanging on him. And he goes, uh, can I sit in with you guys? And, and uh, John, the leader of the thing, he goes, hell no, you got an electric guitar. We don't, I don't want, we don't want no screaming blues here. This is Delta blues, man. Uh, I hope you respect that. And, and then uh, he said, no, I, I won't play that way. I, it's the only guitar I got. I'm playing on the show today. And, well, that's cool, son. He goes, um, 
then he, he whispered to me, do you, do you know this guy? I said, well, yeah, I just met him. I don't really know him. And then I said, I, think, I, I trust him. He's a good guy. He seems like a great guy. Just let him play. And if he plays clean and turns it down, okay, sit in. So he did. And um, we did that part, sound check. And then the show came. And um, we did our blues thing first. And that young kid, he sat in with us. And I did my set. And then he was the last act. And uh, this is kind of mind blowing, but um, <laughs> I got the lyrics here. He taught me. When, I'm almost getting to the point where I'm losing my mind to remember this moment because it was two days with this kid. I mean, I'm just waiting to hear who the kid was. Yeah. So. <clears throat> He gets up there, and the only instrument he had was a was a Fender Telecaster, and it was clean. And he floored the place. He had such high voice and a little bit hyper, sweet, passionate. Like his eyes went into the back of his head. He was like total zone. <laughs> and yeah, and um, it was Jeff Buckley. Oh wow! And um, so I hung out with Jeff that night after the show, and. Uh, we went to some little club downtown, and there were these um, hippie dudes running a, uh, a songwriter circle there. So we thought, well, go down and play a couple tunes. And um, so we go in, and they didn't recognize him or me or anything like that, but they were playing the songs, you know, like um, pretty much basic older ones, like Save the Whales, and we're going to save the whales, and the countryside are going to walk Whatever, simple folky stuff. Nothing against folk. I love folk music, but... People are going to want to kill me, but that's what they were doing. Nice. And and uh, me and Jeff got up there, <laughs> and the guy goes, who the hell are you? You know, we were singing stuff off our cuff. He, he sang a Zeppelin tune, and I sang a song by Spirit, like Nature's Way or something. We were just messing around. Yeah. Uh, you guys are just, you're trying out shyness? Is that the deal? And they got really mad. Are you trying out shyness? whole thing, because there were only six people watching. And they got upset they shut it down. Because we were, we stayed in the in the bar and kept playing. Me and Jeff, and then we went and had a couple of beers together. And the time I spent with them, I can't explain the spirit line that came to me in those hours. But it did. I was gifted deeply by his presence, mm. deeply. And he said the same to me. And I said, you know, I saw you saying Hallelujah. How the hell did you play that, man? And I said, do you write it? He goes, no, Leonard Cohen wrote it. So he he um, he taught it to me. I never sang it until recently. I sang a little bit of it, but because everybody in their life, everybody in the book singing a version of it. Yeah, it's one of those songs that's almost too good for its own good. It is. And, it's yeah. too good, man. And Jeff does it incredible. But yeah, so what I was getting to is the moments that we spend with each other can be suspended. I, I talk about it like Einstein, I like um, quantum physics, like... I try to pass or get equal with the speed of light in a person or a moment. Because if he, he says if you get ahead of the speed of light, the light will freeze. The, the, the moment will stop. You'll get ahead of time. And you'll be able to slow it down and hold that moment for as long as you, as you can. Mm-hmm. And in life, sometimes things just go by way too fast. You got 15 minutes. You got this, you better kiss me now. I ain't going to see you anymore. But there's moments in my life I wish I'd, I could just get back. Mm-hmm. And I remember just saying, well, I'll see you tomorrow. And that person's dead. Mm-hmm. You know. So basically, my music is based on a connection through prayer. And I, I, I pray every day. I pray for other people more than myself. And I also, I'm not saying that to be cool, but that's what I think of. Because a lot of my prayers, I found out they were just what I wanted, not what I needed. And what I want is when I'm helping other people, then it's like a tree or, or roots in the ground. It'll grow back to you. So don't worry about it, but keep in prayer. And my prayers are like yours, uh, are my music. Uh, that's a prayer. It's a song. Sure. Um, uh, helping somebody with a meal, pay for it. That's a prayer. But it's an active prayer. It's a living prayer. You know, I, you know, I'll, I'll watch people hurting in Nashville over the years, seeing us develop. And I, I, I just I find our music community uh, finally, like where you're at now, East Nashville, and there's a, 
Music Healthcare Alliance, and there's people coming around to help musicians because it's a big community here. Mm-hmm. Music Cares has helped a lot of yeah, lot of cats. big time. I love I love what they're doing, and we need to be together. That's why I, I love your show. I hope people support it because what you're doing is getting the lines connected. Well, that's a good way of putting it. Um, <clears throat> I've thought of it more as getting reacquainted with friends, new and old. <laughs> but uh, there's nothing wrong with a higher purpose in it. Now, there's a couple of things you said. There's a Native American writer named Mary Sandoz, and I'm pronouncing her name wrong, I think. But um, she wrote a series of books. And um, But there's a one about um, the Cheyenne, and she talks about like growing up and this concept. When you were talking about time... And she talked about like this place in the Cheyenne conception of time that was the the eternal present. It was always now. Mm-hmm. There was no the past isn't really the past, and mm-hmm. that it is such a nonlinear way of of thinking about time that's foreign to the Western mind. And um, maybe that's a segue into just talking to you. Your upbringing, um, you grew up in Wisconsin. I, I wanted to mm-hmm. say, and um, did you have? Uh, both parents were Native American, or I think that when we've talked, um, you have a white a background. Yeah, and my mother, Native. my mother's from Germany, and so you maybe have like this kind of dual conception of things. That's sort of why you're able to talk I, about. I something. took the dominant conception. Is what <laughs> happened was the dominant was because we lived around Native people, and then we were off the reservation for quite a few years, and we went. But all our relatives, my dad's, are all full blood, mm. so we were in constant touch with them. They weren't real traditional by any means, but they were native enough. But then I got, once we back to the reservation, I, I met head on with the traditional. Mm. And then um, that connection was there. My mother, not to say anything is her thing, but it was never a part really of anything that I grew interested in. Sure. But I, I, now I am. And it's funny, when I've toured in Europe, Germany is probably one of the uh, highest uh, compassionate or want to know more about Native people than any other race I've ever seen. The Swiss and the Germans, they love Native culture. Mm. And they respect it. And they know a lot of history. They do beadwork and quill work and all that kind really? of stuff. Yeah, maximum. But what happened was, is, is the race didn't matter to me. Once you get into the spirit of where you're living, that reservation, those lands, those special spots where you hear things at night. I mean, seriously. Like in the background, one night, me and my buddies in high school, we were on the Wolf River on the Menominee Reservation, and uh, off about about 100 yards away, we hear, it just kept going. And it's going pretty heavy duty, and it was from a distance. I said to my buddy, I go, what the heck is that? Are they doing a pow out there or something? Is someone out there? Does someone live out there? He said, no, nobody lives over there. So then we 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 took our shoes off and waited in a real shallow area of the river, not too shallow, but we got through and we went across and um, there was nothing out there. I mean, we went no. to the sound and the sound disappeared. And we went there several times and there's a rock called Spirit Rock. It's there in between Neopet and Kashina. And it, at that time, uh, the rock was a little bit higher than your ceiling. And um, on top was tobacco offerings, prayer flags and all this. Because they said when that red granite rock goes down, the full bloods are going to be gone, you know. So it's down now, reachable now. But in the days when I heard the the spirits in the woods, um, it was it was big time. It was up there. But those are just one of many spiritual experiences that I've had in that time. And a lot of time, I was told um, by elders to we just were on Indian time, and Indian time is awesome because if it's it's a rise of of cowboy time and ranch time is similar because. Basically, you get there when you get there, and when you get there, we're glad you're here. Mm-hmm. And and quit bitching about time. But Indian time is based in the present tense to hold as much now as you can. Your connection, as you said, the woman with the past is truly there. But do I go backwards to get to No, it should be embedded in you, the memory of my son who, who died at 29. I'll never forget those 29 years. So that's what I hold on to. I... I I, I, I praise God that I, I had him as my son. And in our lives, if we don't start thinking that way, that, oh, my life was screwed. Some of us, they were, but there are always good times, and there's always things that point us to a better way. But I try to stay in the present tense more than ever, because that's where things get done. And that that means when I was coming in your back door here, that's in the past already. <laughs> I don't have to worry about it. We're, we're moving 
And the great thing about this interview, you're moving on our own time. And Man, I have two thoughts about that. One was um, when I was living in Montana, which is right around the time that we met, um, I had, had suffered a recent family tragedy and, and really was like hitting the reset button and was on ranch time. And um, I don't think I saw a clock or operated something that would have, you know, like precision time, even in the phone. I didn't have my phone around um, for three months. And it was like you got up when the sun got up when we do work. You know, it was um, just come by for breakfast. That was yes. as close as time, yes. you know, got. And we got, you know, we quit when the work was done. We went to bed at dark. And there's something about the natural rhythm that I still think about that a lot as I've moved back to civilization, quote unquote. And uh, my life is ruled by clocks so much more than it, they used to be. There's something about that. And then I, I noticed that, like, I'm feeling this more and more um, with, you know, AI coming on. People talk about this all the time. Just even before that with our phones, like people, you know, I go for walks in my neighborhood and I just pass people staring at their screen. And I'm just like, this is the poison of our time. And I'm I'm motivated and moved towards to seek outlets that are in contradiction to this militant technocracy technocracy that's ruling us. Um, and I think that there's a great starving of the spirit in, um, in the West and American culture um, of people just like their souls are aching and crying mm-hmm. from just being ruled by these yeah. devices that we put on ourselves. So in, in what you're talking about is, you know, an antidote to that. Yeah. Well, I, that's even my own, Kids sometimes will criticize me because they don't know how to run this or that computer system or yeah. not on the phone as much as they are or whatever. Or don't play the video games uh, their friends do because I, I I don't I don't really care for it. I, I mean you can do it, but artificial intelligence is just another tool. It's a different type of tool. But when it comes down to spiritual things or anything like that, I would never turn to AI. I don't. I, I <laughs> yeah, no, know. totally. You know what I mean? I'm going to my eagle feathers and I'm going Skynet. to be yeah. in prayer. Yeah, you got your own Skynet. Um, I, w- I want to talk more about um, the tw- the tools of prayer that you've brought with you, but I thought maybe we could do a song first. Yeah. And uh, you talked about the storm yeah. playing that. Do you want to set that up and talk about where that came from? Yeah, interesting song. Um, I, didn't, I didn't even know I'd write it until I was in the hospital over here at... Um, it was 2016. I had a heart failure. They said I had, uh, first they said about 16 hours to live. And then I outdid it. They said, have you six days now? And then they said, you're going to make it. And during the time before I was going to make it, a lot of my friends were calling, what happened to Bill? And um, it was, uh, I found out later, about a few years later, they found um, behind my heart, um, this connection of all these blood vessels that had just basically balled up in a knot and had scar tissue on my heart that was changing my heartbeats. And they said, did you go through some incredible stress in the year 2000, you know, before 2016? I said, yeah, my son was killed. Whoa. And um, I had some other things going on. My mom died before that and divorce and all that. I said, well, those things will wreck your heart. And... um, so I, I, I was focused on trying to heal, but there was a point in the hospital where I was like, the present tense was painful. It was it was very painful, meaning physical. My heart was hurting. I was on this med. I'm sitting there in a bed. I couldn't move, and I hadn't worked in a while. I didn't have the money to pay. All the negatives were coming at me, and they were weighing on me hard, hard. And I, I just, I really just wanted to say, screw it. I, I just take me home. Mm. I, I don't care to live anymore. Um, and this friend of mine, George, he's an incredible guy. He's a, a fighter, a black belt, and we used to talk about fighting, and I used to, back in the day when I was younger, used to be in a boxing team, and my brothers are all great boxers, but I like working out on a bag, you know, just it gets a lot of stress out. He comes up to me, he goes, Bill, who are you? And I go, Bill, I'm Bill. You know, I had these tubes, and he goes, well, are you the same guy that won three Grammys, you know. Yeah, really? Are you the guy that toured with so-and-so and and you you this guy? Are you the guy that had five kids and one of them just died? Yeah. Are you the guy that kept me in all these circumstances in my life? So yeah, it's me. No, it's not. Those are past. You are, who are you now? I go, 
I don't know what you're talking about. Mm. He said, you're a storm. I go, what do you mean? You're a storm within a storm, and he who made the storm is within you. And he walked out. I'm like, what is that about? And um, I stayed for about 10 hours, thing, and, and uh, I got somebody to go get me a guitar, and I wrote the song in the hospital. And I felt no pain I saw ghosts as they were rising from the graves I became a storm within a storm In a storm I was saved There was a storm, 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 storm Deep inside of me
that's one of the things about uh, living a long time is that things happen, bad, good, and different. And um, mm. one of the things that I, uh, you know, it's made me have so much respect for you is that you have, you know, you've had some some rough patches in there, and yet here you are, and arguably in the, you know, the most promising phase of your career even mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. and um, that's a testament to your resilience and also maybe the grace of God. Yeah, uh, all of that. I think, I think the grace of God works differently than what, I mean, it's, it's like it. I guess it is, but the grace of God allows me to be a musician, allows me to be myself. It doesn't change me. Uh, I don't think God wants to change me and make me, and now you should be just like Garth Brooks, or you should probably be a little bit more like... That would be a shame. You know what I'm saying, or whatever, some artist. But no, it it allows me the freedom, that free will, by the grace of God, I got that, that I can do what I was gifted with the day I was born. And it doesn't mean I'm going to be the top... Uh, guitar player in the world, or anything like that. I I I picture myself like um, like back when we were little kids. Remember those grade school days? We're on little carpets or having milk and whatever the heck we're doing, and we're doing that. And then you get up to the other grades where you start becoming part of a group. And then at the end of the year, the teacher will give out awards and says, "Corby, you're you're most likely to do this," or "Billy Miller." You know, I feel like that now. That it isn't like we weren't superstars yet. We couldn't be the all-star on the basketball team or baseball team, and they start getting awards and you start feeling the fame and the, that whole famous and infamous and dominant and all that stuff. It isn't in there in, in me anymore. I don't, I don't, I, first of all, I don't need it. I don't need dominance. Mm. Um, I need to, but I, what I need to do is dominate uh, toxic issues in my life rather than letting them run me down mm. and uh, dominate my flesh Compared, uh, my spirit dominates, and it's a good domination. But anything else, I I've learned over the years in playing music and being on several record labels that seeking fame is a dangerous. I love Dave, David Bowie's song about fame. He and John Lennon wrote that, but you know, uh, he talks about in that song, fame. It'll it'll tear you down. Mm-hmm. I seek excellence through communication and prayer, and through this earth, and and through the the, the skies with reaching out to God, but. We're here now, so that's where my focus is on. I'm not in the heavens. I'm not I'm not flying around the world. I'm walking the streets of Nashville. What the heck can I do here when I'm off the road? When I'm on the road, who can I talk to? And hmm. um, I take advantage of that, and it heals me. It heals everything in me. One of the things that uh, I've heard a phrase a long time ago that really struck me, and it's part of what like animates me even today and as part of this project and it's very simple it's um the phrase is grow where you're planted and i think that's such a great clue to doing something positive with your life on whatever scale you know big or Mm -hmm. small and i think that's kind of what you're talking about right now it's like i feel like you're you're very much um growing where you're planted (laughs) even though that plant's moving all over the country (laughs) it is but it's connecting with so many people People that I, when I meet on the road, where do you live? I said, Nashville. They go, oh, my God, country music. And they think only one thing, you know? Yeah. Tourists and country music. Well, it is that, but it's much more. Like, it's, it's you. It's me. It, differences that are making a difference. And um, you have a different tree rooted here. So do I. And it's still going to grow, you know? I, um, talk about talk about what you brought with us. Yeah, br- brought with you today. Um, you were you, you were riffing on it before the mics were rolling. I was going to um, bring all the things of prayer, but I couldn't fit them on the table. But you were, you were talking about the three imp- most important I- Indian art, Native American art. Yes. Um, yeah. So this could be just a, a just a regular drum, but it's I, I decorated. In fact, it it broke on me. It's an older drum, and it. And, <laughs> I had to fix it up, but it still has a great tone. And I, when I was fixing it, I thought, I, I want to beautify it. And I, I put some simple artwork on it. The stone comes from the river that I used to fish and swim in on the reservation, the Red River. And it's a natural stone. And most prayer stones are like this. They're round. They're different kinds of stones. And I hold it to um, give me that energy, and, and it gets me going. It's like, it just does. And the eagle feathers and that. But the three parts of the Indian art are function. Everything has a function. Like this is a fan, and it's used by dancers. It's used in healing ceremonies. Mainly that's how I, that's how I use it for prayer and healing. 
and um, and then it's just it, it's it's just a powerful, beautiful work of art. So everything had a function. So that was the first thing. Secondly, was beauty, which I talked about beautifying it with beadwork or quill work or anything you want to beautify. What you're about is okay. You know, like our music, uh, your studio. You know, I noticed you added the ceiling height and all. It's beautiful. I in did, here. yeah. And um, but the other thing is ourselves. We th- got to look at ourselves as a work of art. And the most important part after you beautify yourself, and not to be egotistical, I'm not talking that beauty, but inner beauty and outer beauty, they can work together, uh, is spirit. And that's the most important part of my life right now, because that's what kept me alive after the heart failure. That's what keeps me playing music. After this many years, I'm in my late 60s, I, I'm not stopping. I don't even want to retire. I have no desire to retire unless my mind or spirit said, I'm sick of music, and I doubt that'll ever happen. You know, I doubt it. Yeah, and you too. It's just we are creative people. So those are the three parts that I use uh, in my daily source. Like, am I functioning okay? And I can't function if I'm stoned on crack cocaine. You know, <laughs> I can't function if I'm depressed about my, you know, some girlfriend leaving me or something. Whatever. All these songs, I can't function correctly, which is the dang truth. Uh, you don't have to be overly healthy to function great. I've seen people who don't eat that great or other things. They function, but the, the thing that drives them is the last element. It's the spirit. Yeah. Whether they have two days left to live or, or not, you know. Um, the beauty part is for us to look at you. Wow, you're a beautiful man. You're, you're, you're thing, you, your songs are beautiful. And they're for us to realize that we have a beauty because a lot of us uh, I think, well, that's a bad side of me. Oh, I guess I gained weight. I'm older now. And I, I look terrible. I look great in my 20s. Screw that shit. You know, you gotta you gotta see as the beauty of the day. I'm a, I'm alive. I'm who I am. And if you can't see that, then you need to look a little bit deeper. But I I try to see the beautiful parts of our lives more than the decrepit parts or the darker edges. And um, we each have a story too, and it has in our own way a function to help us keep going and a, and a beauty beautiful side. And then there's the spirit side that is alive and well within us as we're walking, as I'm talking to you. Um, one of the things that I think of, and I'm going to articulate this maybe badly, but here we goes. Um, there's, you know, the way I was brought up, I came from a long line of preachers, evangelical family. And the idea being that, like, you know, there's nothing between you and God. You could pray. You know, this is like a very non-Catholic approach. You know, um, And I understand that and respond to it. And, um, but there's this, the, there's something about, um, the absence of art and tools for prayer that is kind of impoverishing a little bit. And yeah. whereas having these implements, um, in your physical possession in around you, surrounding yourself by them helps, um, in that, uh, that effort to connect to the divine and that's it seems like you know you're 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 very much um wrapped up in that it's very like a part of your identity and uh i've always like ever since i met you been attracted to that and um even this idea of just having implements is what you know like you gave me this necklace i wear it all the time yeah, yeah. um the you drew me that picture of the the feather you can't see it right now it's mm-hmm. around the corner but it's in my like this is my like sacred space in this corner here where i write every morning mm-hmm. and it's like mm-hmm. part of the things that get me you know t- feeling connected or, or having an you know an, an effort to connect maybe even um I just think that we would all do better to yeah. surround ourselves with objects that take us right. upward. <laughs> you know, it, we all need that uh, push. I, I, you're correct. There's nothing between us and God, really, the church and politics, all that can get in the way. But we ourselves are our own worst enemy. We're the ones that get in the way between prayer, to me, because we get depression or we get thinking, well, I'm not good enough for you. And Well, no, you're not. I mean, I'm, I'm really not that great of a guy, but... You are, and when you're within me, and I tell people, I don't worship. I don't sit down and worship this fan every day. (laughs) Whatever, you know. (laughs) You are going to take me to the place of winning the lottery tomorrow. (laughs) No, I I worship with these. These are, like I said, instruments of prayer and instruments of peace. They get me on a right tone. Like uh, I'll get in a dead zone where I don't have these. I'll be at a gas station outside, and I'll, I'll... 
I'll, I'll, I'll get triggered by someone that looks like my son. And I got, oh, I got to pray that this way out so I don't start crying here. Mm. But I don't have these with me. But I, I have the connection because I build it up with this. It's like we got to fill our spiritual tanks up like we do our cars. I look at cars, great, their vehicles. Same with a horse when they had horses. But you have to feed that horse. You have to feed that car. You have to check the oil. You can't just keep driving a nice car and all of a sudden one day <laughs> blows up because you didn't check your fluids. Mm. Um, our spiritual uh, fluids that keep us flowing in the river of time with all these uh, spiritual events have to be um, uh, somewhat disciplined ourselves in a good discipline way to to fill yourself with a walk by a creek. Uh, today in Nashville, go down or, or come over to my area and go by Radnor Lake and spend some time there. There's a couple of eagles that live in there. Um, or, or sit out uh, like last night, I mean... Uh, a friend of mine went outside. It was a little cooler, but the sky was clear as a bell. You could see the moon and the stars. You need to take that time, as corny as it sounds, you know, and you need to take those times with your cup of coffee and go go get that because those are chargers. But if you wanted to see the power, what it's like to hold a stone from a river, not bought in a stone uh, a store, and find it yourself, journey to find that prayer stone mm-hmm. that you hold, that I hold, that it, it, it makes, um, like, what do I get from my, when I hold this prayer stone? It's like, it's round, it's smooth, it's beautiful, it's natural. I love its color. It reminds me of home and all those things. I, I, I'd i say go back to where you were born or wherever you, you find most precious and find a stone or something you can take with you the rest of your life. This is never going to break on me and, and won't mold or melt away. It's naturally made. And I, I get it. I hold it for maybe... 10, 20 minutes sometimes before I get into it. Boom, I got it. That's like us playing guitar. Oh, I got a song now. But you got to touch something. Hold that for a second. <laughs> I mean, it just fits right in your hand. Yeah, it fits you, you right there. Hold it. It's powerful. Mm. And uh, the wind is powerful. I try to get outside when it's windy because I need that. Like this will show you the power of an eagle's feathers. These are... There's a tail feathers, but you can see that. It's crazy how much wind just it Just the makes. wind it gives on you, you know. It's just opening up the sky. And then there's tones that we, I call them sympathetic tones. They use it in classical music, but like people think a piano is a pedal and this. But it's it's like a big butt guitar. It's got strings. And when you hit a chord uh, that is connected with the minor chord and, and six keys and three over here, they are colliding molecularly and they're creating a um, sympathetic tone with the violas and everything else comes together well so I as a musician know the key I don't know what key that's in but I went sympathetic with it like mm-hmm. well this is your it's voice. got a tone though it's got a I'm going to sing with you it's what fathers should do with their sons mm. and their daughters Mm-hmm. They're crying out to you. You tend to cry from a businessman's point of view, or I'm the CEO <laughs> here, damn it, you know, or or I'm the alcoholic in this house. You don't know what you're crying about. Just <laughs> shut up. I walk to school barefoot, you know. No, shut the heck up and sympathize with your child, or sympathize with your wife or your daughter. People don't do that. They they wait for a counselor to tell them how to do that. I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't need. I'm done with counselors, man. Mm-hmm. They can just. They can go get 150 bucks an hour from somebody else. But, you know, I remember a couple of times I was with counselors, and I was counseling them at the end of the thing. Oh, I like what you said. Can you tell me what you said again? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll get my money back then. I think we can counsel each other through prayer for each other, holding each other, sympath- sympathetic tones. Musicians get it all the time. That's why they look so high on stage when they're not. They may get high later, but on stage, they're literally sympathetic tones uh-huh. are going from that drum to the guitar player and to the audience at the Ryman and from this thing and in the in the in the in the tribal ways like indigenous people rely on those sympathetic tones to help heal things to help bring them up man i it was a uh, two thoughts one is um i just came across this picture a couple of days ago 
um, on the internet and it was, you know, the, the overtone scale, like, you know, if you have a string and you hit, you hit the string the whole vibration is, you know, it looks like this. And then if you hit a harmonic halfway through, like on a guitar on the 12th fret, and then it's, it's bisected and you can, you know, the harmonic scale will continue and the, the intervals get smaller and smaller. And they had, they had compared this, you know, the, the representation of all of the subdivisions of, of a whole string um, and superimposed it against uh, an X-ray of a nautilus, like a shell, mm. and the, it, exactly the same um, <laughs> re- repetitions in nature. And I'm mean, just like, that's so powerful. And when you play music, we take it for granted. But um, I, I, I try not to. But like, even there's so much power in just um, playing one chord or even one note on a guitar if you do it. With intention, this sounds like I know I can say this stuff to you. But, um, this is what, one of the reasons why I love you because we can talk about really spiritual things in a serious way. Um, but I've always felt that way, and one of the the one of my desires um, for life is that everybody have some connection to music that they do themselves, not mm-hmm. for to be on stage and in front of people and to be as a vehicle for fame or whatever, but as a, a, an a intimate experience that you have from your heart with the world around you in a really basic way. And that's like anybody can play, can learn to play mm-hmm. a few chords on a guitar, can learn how to play their own, their own, their, their favorite song that somebody else wrote, who cares? But when you sit in a room and you're playing that music, you're now aligned with these eternal things that are much bigger than you. Right. Um, Cause I know you can riff, you can, you can relate to that. And the other thing is that uh, one, th- one of the greatest gifts that my parents gave me, uh, my parents would be like, um, they're kind of country folk, you know, my, they're both hard work, hardworking people. I come from basically the potato patch part of the mm-hmm. part of Idaho. Mm-hmm. Um, but they had a very, um, frank, uh, connection to songs and reading. And so when I was a little kid, you know, my parents read to me all the time mm-hmm. and it was just like a thing that they did. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it just like without, you know, they didn't tell me to read, but I was around it all the time and I just mm. kind of f- fell in love with it. And the other thing was that my father sang around us all mm. the time, just to sing, you know, just like in the yard working, he'd just sing a John Denver song, <laughs> acapella. <laughs> and, uh, that, that thing, what it taught me was that like, I too can sing. It wasn't like a specialty that somebody else on TV mm-hmm. did because they were experts at it. It was just like a thing that you did in your life. And that's what it is to this day. And for saying, you know, I've been fortunate to like been able to include it in my life as an adult. And I'm really grateful for that. But most of what music means to me has to do um, with what I do here behind closed doors. And, right. you know, personally, and there's a small fraction of it I share with other people, not I don't know, just out of circumstance presently. But um, yeah, I think that 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 is a gift that I I got that I'm really grateful for. It's just like having that interaction on a a daily basis. You could hear their tones and their, well, whatever, like music around you. I was going to mention too that you were talking about the lines. And like I I checked it out once on on a guitar and a tuner. I I tune it and I'm watching the strings. You can see them vibrate into tune, into pitch. Um, Yeah. And they start harmonizing. You can see them shake. The thing that I I've noticed about people too that we who are suicidal or about to do something, make some bad decisions is um, they're putting off tones as well. Everybody mm-hmm. puts off a tone, and especially people are close to us. And we got to be careful to to hear their tones. That's what I'm saying. Communicate in those tones of love and song and holding them or just speaking, because a, a dissonant chord. A dissonance in some people is actually them showing you their spirit is not their their mind or, or they don't want to tell you but I'm hurting right now mm-hmm. and you can tell when someone's hurting if you if you're looking for the tone you go man maybe you need to stay over tonight maybe you don't need to go home tonight you might be too drunk or you might whatever and just too depressed let's let's just just hang here for a while mm-hmm. and let them get their tone back together sort of the mental health thing because I've worked in a lot of uh, I've done several concerts in prisons, and I've done a lot of things in mental health institutions. And I noticed that they picked up on music like you, you never believe. You know, they, they are into it. Uh, I think their their tones of depression and anger and whatever it may be, uh, they're they're in a dissonant world that doesn't harmonize a lot. They they love it when there's harmony there. They love it when there's a a major chord that would even be associated with them. It's not like we have to 
do major sevens all our lives. La di da. How are you? La di da today. Yeah, I'm going. <laughs> let's all sing about California. Mm-hmm. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, I'm talking about the 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 power of being um, that loving, that positive, that caring, uh, that you can. And a lot of these people who've done some dark stuff, they they have a heart way down, but it's down there. You got to dig for it sometimes. Mm-hmm. But uh, I've had some pretty rough. Um, incidents have seen a lot of, a lot of trauma on the reservation and reservations around the country that I grew up with, and my prayers are are just, they do go out every day for those people, and I'm reminded by him. It's another thing. Get something that reminds you of the people you're praying for. The, the, these are my relatives, mm. and I'm going to pray for them. But so are you, my relative, and it can expand from there. I, I may have a priority like if you like beets and I don't like beets. That's good. I'm glad you like beets. I don't like them, but we're both healthy. You know what I'm saying? So uh, my prayers are dedicated to where my roots are. And then I can expand, as you said, because the majority of my prayer is done in silent, not silent, but singing on drum or playing or singing in my home or in my car, in my hotel room. But then outwardly, I, I don't, unless I'm asked to at, a, at an event or at a wedding or, or at a funeral, I'll, I'll pray publicly. Mm-hmm. Or if I meet a homeless guy in the street, he needs prayer. Just the day I was, the other day I was in a restaurant. I met a guy. I could just tell he was going off the mark, mm-hmm. and uh, he was an alcoholic. But he's he's working through it. And he said, "I enjoy be- waiting on you, Bill, and I've known you for years. Would you mind encouraging me with 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 like uh, with what?" I I said, "With prayer." He says, "Yeah, sure." And in those moments, I'm not afraid to pray for somebody in a restaurant. I mean, that's such a vulnerable thing for him to, to, yeah. to say to you. He you could know? sense that I would do it. And I, I love that I have that power that's emitting from me. Because there was a time when I didn't. There was a time I was super defensive, and I felt that people, hypocrites and stuff, were bugging me. And I said, nah, I'm not giving anything to you. But I, I, you can't look at hypocrites because they're, are you a hypocrite? Then go ahead and join them. But if you're not, then don't worry about them. Because you, you can make your own path. Mm-hmm. That's like coming to Nashville and saying, well, damn, there's a lot of good steel players here. And um, I think I'll just go back to Iowa, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Which you is need, fair if you want to do that. Yeah, if you want to do that, go. If you want to get in with the guys and jam with them and learn a little more. Um, would you mind playing Dark River? I'd love to play Dark River.
sky The change is coming Don't cry I Talk with angels Walk with men I See your vision To the end of Um, man, that was great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And uh, what? let's talk about, you're so, um, one of my favorite things about you is that you never really want to talk shop. You, you don't want to talk about the deep stuff, which is where I, mm-hmm. um, I'm most comfortable in a way. Um, and But you have a lot going on in in your career right now. So you're, tr- you're tr- touring all the time. You just, you have a new label in management. Mm-hmm. And you also talk about... Um, your work with orchestras, you had that symphony that you did. Yeah, The Last Stand. I, I created that and quite a while ago and I toured Israel with it and it, it sold out and I found it to be a little bit of a, it was a beautiful moment to play with symphonies, but it's a headache to study all that music and to get it going. I'm like, oh my God, this is like a science experiment. But <laughs> you memorize it and I played it and it was a lot to do and I, I just distanced myself from it. But then it came back again mm. Last year, I sang at a funeral of a good friend of mine who was in the arts and, and um, really a great guy. His name was Andy and from Madison. And attending his funeral were a lot of arts people. And one of them was the symphony director for the Chamber Orchestra in Wisconsin, very well-known man from uh, New Zealand. And um, he goes, man, I just love what you do. He says, uh, "Would you ever? did you ever play with the symphony? I said, yeah, I've done that. And now we're going to do one. We're going to do a big show in Madison where there's going to be like... 30,000 people coming to this huge event that I'm, I'm the, on the main stage. Amazing. And my band were playing songs in between the things. So I have to relearn my symphony again. But this time, since I know the symphony so well, this is a great thing. He is allowing me to play with it. So I'm actually, for the first time in my life, I'm going to rise above it like we have this, uh, whatever, life after death experience or whatever, during thing where you rise above the body and go, oh, they're operating in my heart. <laughs> I'm, I can have the symphony, you know, and I'll just rise above it. And I know where we're at, and I'm not playing the part I did before because it was right with the symphony, like my guitar, the flute. It was boring. I'm thinking, no, screw that. I'm playing some more flute. Yeah. And he goes, play it, man, because you know the key. So I'm going to play over that. I'm going to chant over it with the hand drum. I'm going to play some guitar parts if I feel like it. And I'm going to float amongst all the movements. There's four movements. It's a 27-minute symphony. Fantastic. And uh, I'm excited about that. Yeah. And um, I'm also... Teaching in certain colleges and with uh, other orchestras, uh, how to connect with the spirit line of your music. There's the shop thing. How do we do it? I don't show them the chords to do it. I show them the way to approach the chord. Or basically, if you're a flute player or you're a cello player or whatever, I'm trying to find who are you, like I was asking in the writing of the song The Storm, which I, I did on your show. But I'm trying to, who are you on, in this in this pit? Who are you? Because they've lost touch. A lot of them, they say, well, I'm playing those notes of Bach and Beethoven and whoever, you know, and I'm part of the symphony. But there's no individuality there as much. Where you get a guy like Yo-Yo Ma who kicks Butox, and he rises above the whole symphony because he's on his own. Mm -hmm. I said, you don't have to be him, but you can rise. You don't have to get off the notes because some of the directors, oh, you're playing that wrong, too much spirit. Mm -hmm. And I hate that because when I play the symphonies, they would say that with a couple of musicians who were playing my music. I said, hold it, hold it. I wrote the song. I like what he did. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So they let them jump out of the box. Mm-hmm. And I said, on your own, can you play that instrument at home with more spirit or even connect your life to your playing and see what it does to your um, to your music? And several times I've heard from them saying, man, I feel better playing now with the symphony than I did because I connected with me. I shut me off. I turn the classical stuff on and read the notes, and I dress up, and I go home. It's like a job. Yeah. And a lot of people do. Session guys or certain things, 
But the guys in Nashville, I learned from them too. The session guys, they're they're incredible. They they add to the songs what makes those songs a hit mm-hmm. because they're filled with spirit. They're filled with spirit. Yeah, yeah it's, it's they're cool. incredible players. Um, I'm just gonna say that it's been a real joy to connect with you again and talk with you and thank you so much for sharing your heart and your perspective on your life and your music and let's get together and write one here Heck soon. Yeah. Let's write a few. Okay. I look forward to it all. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching. Go ahead and click here to like and subscribe. You can click right there to watch another video or click here to watch a playlist featuring the songs of the Morse Code Podcast. Okay, thank you very much.